Welcome to chapter 9, Services Marketing. As with several of the other chapters, this is a summary of a summary. We have a full-fledged semester-length Services Marketing course, and consequently, you're going to get a highlights package here. Now, Services Marketing is interesting because it's one of the dominant areas of research in Australian and New Zealand marketing. And it's also relatively new. Now, for a, a context here, in 1985, the services discipline was being discussed in terms of whether it was a legitimate separate part of marketing theory. In 1995, there was still argument over whether, in fact, services marketing constituted a separate uh, part of marketing thought, and in 2004, the service dominant logic tried to reintegrate services back into the fold of goods logic and basically have a represent a single unified theory of marketing. So, while services marketing is a distinct area and it has a pedigree and a long track record of being a distinct section of marketing. There is still effort being made, usually on, it seems, about a decade interval, to try and turn services marketing back into just another part of goods and ideas marketing. So where are we at now in the proceedings? Services is still about the creation of the value proposition. And in particular, the nature of the service product because the consumer has to be a lot more involved and a lot more engaged in creating a service, what you actually have here is a much more customer-centric opportunity. So when you go to a service, say you go to a hairdresser, you are required to participate. To start with, you need to be there. But secondly, you need to help work with the provider, work with the hairdresser to get the best outcome. If you walk in there, close your eyes and say, surprise me, then you're not necessarily going to get what you want from the experience. At the same time, if you go to an accountant and don't provide information to the accountant, don't play your role of bringing your taxes or bringing your uh, financial information with you, they can't provide you with a service. Contrast this with walking into a store like Kmart where the goods are on the shelf and it's your choice as to what you take with you and what you buy. So they've pre-provided, there's less engagement, there's less that you have to do. So what is a service? The first thing is a service is best considered to be an act, a performance or an experience. It is intangible. So it is something that is performed. So when you think about marketing in terms of being a process, the service is the product that is the closest then to being a pure process. Because it's intangible, it can't be touched. It can, and this um, element of it being intangible, means we can't do things like stockpile it. We can't pre-produce. We also have a different set of classifications of services that we're going to talk about based on what part of the service interacts with you. Does it interact with your belongings? Does it interact with you? Or do you interact with it? So the other aspect to really understand about services is they are skills-based products. So they're very dependent on their employees and they're very dependent on the skill of the provider. So the four key characteristics of services that you need to appreciate. And these four characteristics are a starting point to consider how does the marketing of a physical good differ from the marketing of a performed act. They're not universal, perfect, separated parts. There are elements you'll see, say intangibility, that you look back at the augmented product model and go, well, isn't most of the augmented product model intangible? But here what we're looking at is that the dominant features of the actual product are that a service is intangible. Because it's a performance, that you can't take the performance with you. 
What we do as marketers to compensate for intangibilities, we try and bring more physical evidence and more physical elements to services marketing to compensate. So you'll go to a performance, you'll go to a theatre performance, and they'll sell you a program. The program becomes the physical evidence that you attended and the prompt for your memories. You go to a concert series, or you have a musician who puts on a concert series who then creates a tour DVD, which is attempting to tangibilize what the concert experience was. So intangibility, it's also a feature that you can really work with here because it's a service based on skill. The less physical items you need to perform the skill, the easier it is to make the skill portable. So you can actually do things uh, from the service point of view. Intangibility lets you make home delivery options available, changes your distribution channel, and also lowers you, quite often lowers your startup costs. Second aspect, critical aspect, is the inseparability. Now this is an area that has been subject to a degree of criticism from the Vargo and Lush 2004 service dominant logic. In Vargo and Lush, they believe that all goods have the inseparability. The nature of a service dominant logic is that there is an embedded service in all physical artifacts. So when you are using a hairbrush to brush your hair, you are enabling the embedded service of hairdressing. It does lead to questions such as what is the embedded service of a ham sandwich, but it's also this aspect of the point of production and the point of consumption are at the same point, in the same location. A consumer needs to be present for the service to be consumed, whereas with a physical object, you can produce the object without the consumer being present. So this makes it, uh, again, with inseparability, what you look at from a marketer's perspective is, do you reduce the inseparability or do you increase it? From electronic marketing, online banking increases the separability between the financial and the consumer. Now, yes, you need to be at your internet connection to perform the service, but you can set up automated tasks. You can establish a level of separability. At the same time, the inseparability becomes important when you think about it from the point of view of a skills-based, personally delivered service where you are wanting the personal interaction, you're wanting the personal contact. So you need to be at the point, particularly something like a medical-based skill such as dentistry, you can't leave your teeth at the dentist to be repaired and come back and pick them up later like you can with your car. The other two elements that are key characteristics of services that we talk about and we emphasize is the nature of perishability. And this is the idea that the service is time sensitive. You cannot stockpile it, and that a service that has not been used is a service that has been wasted. I always refer to this as the first commercial application of time travel will be being able to go back in time and fill up empty spots on the service roster. But basically, you can't stockpile a service. You can't set aside a dozen haircuts. You can't put aside half a dozen massages to be used later when the clients show up, you can't prepare in advance. So this puts a lot of pressure on the marketer to get the supply and demand aspects of services right, and also to look at capacity management from the point of view of, do we ensure that, do we modify our pricing to ensure constant use of the facilities? Do we raise the pricing to move demand, whether it's peak demand or peak use? And the final aspect is the variability. And again, this is a feature as much as it uh, could be seen as a bug. Variability means that each time the service is performed, it will differ. What we do to reduce that is that we can use standardizations. For this subject, for this semester, one of the standardization factors that I am using is a pre-recorded video. Because this video has been committed now to electronic memory, it will become standardized. However, should I attempt to 
re-give a lecture based on these slides, it will not be the same performance. Even down to this example, this example is most likely to change. Now, variability can be a downside because you are trying to establish quality, consistency, and establish a level of stability in the service offering so that the customer has a reasonably good idea what to expect the next time they're coming to receive the service. It also is the strength of services. The variability means that you can customize the service. Each service becomes a new experience. You can then try to leverage off, say, the needs of your market. You can have a highly variable service that innovators love because no two experiences are the same. You can have a highly customized service where your close quarters interaction which really emphasizes the inseparability of the service from production and consumption becomes a feature that you pay a premium for because it is going to be a different service each time that you and the provider co-create. So with the four factors, the thing to be looking at again is that these are four areas that distinguish services, but they are inherently neutral. It's your application of the four characteristics that matters. So if something is perishable, then you can price premium to say one night only, limited time, because there's no opportunity to repeat this. If it's variable, you can point out that it's either going to be customized, or if you're there, if you're not there, you've missed it, because we're not going to be doing that again. So perishability and variability can become features of the product to emphasize and sell. So in terms of some of the things for you to be thinking about as an apprentice marketer, and we spent a lot of time dealing with this in the services marketing course, the response to each of the four cores, the four pillars of our distinction of service, we can either try and reduce it or we can try and emphasize it. So with intangibility, we do put a lot of effort into reducing the intangible nature of a service by providing physical cues. We put in an, we put in logos, we put in uniforms, we have a website, we have brochures, we have flyers. We set a lot of effort and emphasis on the physicality of the environment so that as an individual consumer, you can judge and make proxy judgments on the quality of the service based on the environment around you. Similarly, for inseparability and perishability, we're going to go and look at this from the point of view of inseparability means it's probably time to have franchises, licenses, and intermediaries. Perishability, similarly, peak demand, being able to go and deal with high demand periods by having the capacity, having flexible capacity. And the variability, this is one of the factors that because it's a human interaction, we have two levels of variability. And the first level of variability comes from the provider. As we are humans giving a personal service, we can vary in how well we deliver our service that day. Also, the customer is variable. The customer's temporary characteristics, if we go back and look at the consumer behavior, we look at the situational characteristics where you have the internal characteristics of the consumer, plus the cues from the physical environment, plus the temporal pressures. If you're going in to get a haircut because it's a scheduled monthly appointment, versus you're going in to get a haircut because in an hour after the haircut, you have a meeting, possibly a job interview, there's going to be a little variation in how much pressure you're going to feel under to get this haircut done and done well. So you as a customer will vary as much as the provider will vary, and some, quite frequently you will vary a lot more than the provider will. So your subjective view of the experience of the service is as variable as the potential for the service to be done in a different way or a different manner each time. 
So the other aspect of marketing here is that we have an extended marketing mix. You're familiar now with the four Ps. Well, in, ma in the services marketing, we gain three extra elements. When you actually look at the history of the four Ps, it started off as 30, then basically it came down to there's only four people who re really remembered for fiscal goods. Because on a fiscal good, once you know the price, the product, the promotion, and the place, you're pretty much sorted. In services, because you are dependent on the human interaction, people become a core part of your marketing mix. And, as you can see from the definition of marketing, marketing is a process, services is the procedural end of marketing. You are delivering service through a system and this also then means that we are going to be dependent on the external cues of the fiscal facilities. And this part of the mix links back to the environmental cues and triggers we saw in consumer decision making. So these three elements are worth looking at. You can bring process and fiscal facilities into play in goods, and you can bring people into play in ideas. So when you're looking at goods, services, and ideas, you could also bring you could try to bring people, process, and physical facilities across to goods marketing, but they're less effective. So one of the things that we mentioned at the top was that there is a classification scheme for services. And what you are looking at here is, does the service interact with the customer directly or on something the customer owns? So, Interacting with the customer directly, this is your hairdressing, dentistry. Interacting on something the customer owns, this is your car mechanic, car service. And is the service mostly intangible or relatively intangible? Now, this gives us quite obviously then a two by two matrix and your examples are on the screen. The inter intangible interaction with the customer is one of the things that services real strength, that we are creating and selling experience. So you come to the university, you come to the Friday class, you interact with each other, you walk away, there's been no tangible objects, there's been no physical goods made, you didn't have any possessions with you, it was all about the talking, the conversation, the experience, customer intangible interaction. On the flip side is that you then come down to you know, a personal trainer or a massage or a haircut. Something has tangibly affected your existence. Your hair has changed color, shape or length. We head down then to services performed on objects. And we're looking at here, car repair, house cleaning, package delivery. And then across to the intangible object, the intangible ownership finance, banking, accounting, and an enormous amount of the internet. We possess files. We have hard drives that are containing files, but these files, we can't touch those files. Those files aren't real. Facebook isn't real. We perceive it as real, but there is nothing that you can actually hold up and say, this is a Facebook or a piece of a Facebook. For those of you about to hold up your phones, that's the platform upon which Facebook is conducted. So we have the intangible action over possessions. We still think of our data as a possession, but it is still an inter intangible interaction over an intangible object. It's very, very meta in case you're wondering. So another aspect of way of conceiving the world is to think of not goods and services as independent ideas, but goods and services as a continuum. On the far end of a goods and services continuum, you will see predominantly solid objects where the actual product is the main feature set and these actual products have tangible cues. On the far end, the other end of the spectrum, you have the service, which is the actual product is predominantly intangible but that there are augmented products that are physical cues. So we look at the example on the screen, remembering that the core actual and augmented product 
In the core product, the satisfaction is intangible. What the core product is always an intangible. It is a concept, a belief, a feeling, an experience. What distinguishes goods and services is the actual product and the augmented product. What is, where is the physicality? Is it the physicality sitting inside the actual product? We look at something here then like salt, pet food, a car, or is the physicality sitting inside the augmented product? Teaching, theatre. Where physicality resides becomes important. Because in the actual product, the physicality then can be enhanced by layering on an augmented product service. The augment, if it's the service is in the actual product, we can enhance the actual product by layering on an augmented physical product. So the key here is not, again, it's not a good or bad, it's a spectrum. It is basically what sits where. In the core and the actual product, what is the dominant element? If it's physically dominant, then it's goods. If it's intangibly dominant, then it's services. And because you then have the opportunity to enhance with what is not being used, this means that you can do a lot of useful things with marketing tricks. It also means you have things like uh, the fast food outlets where the actual product, is the actual product the food? Or is the actual product the service? Is it the, sp the convenience is the core product? If it's convenience, the core product you're seeking is convenience, then the actual product is the speed of delivery. The augmented product is food that you can hold in one hand. So you're looking at this again. You can mess around with this. You can play with this. And this is a great place when you start wanting to think about, how, well, how would we do product development? How would we go and take an existing product and reframe it so it was attracting a new audience? And bundling on an augmented service or bundling on an augmented physicality might be the way to do that. Okay, the goods dominant. Uh, one of the things I want to raise a quick point here is that the idea, the concept of service dominant and goods dominant came from the Vargo and Lish paper in 2004, where as they were advocating the theory of service dominant logic, they created the straw theory of goods dominant logic. Nobody called it goods dominant until the two authors needed to say the words service dominant and have a counterpoint. So this is only a 10 year old theory. This is a very young theory. Now, again, what you're looking for here is that if you've got a physical good, you're wanting to put on a supporting service. This is actually why cat food has a website. Cat, cats don't surf. Cats don't go to the internet saying, you know what, I should go to whiskers.com and see what's up. But if you put a cat site, a URL on the back, of an enhanced service of cats, you know, advice for looking after your cats, share your cat photos, cat community, then you're augmenting a very physical, very ordinary physical product with an augmented product service and service of community. Seriously, cats don't need their own websites. All right, equipment facility based services. This is where we get some of the distribution and logistics challenges in. This is where a service needs specific, needs to be located somewhere specific or needs something specific to operate. Again, the restaurant's probably the best facet of this, where what you're looking for is to be able to say, here is a location that we have control over the environmental factors, that we can modify the environment, and therefore we can create either the consistency or we can create the reduce the intangibility, or we can create an environment which is a safe space to co-create and construct a service that pretty much it's a blank template. So what you're looking at here on these types of services is your factors of distribution become a key part of your marketing mix. You also have a bit of pricing because you've got a facility, you've got a finite location and a finite volume. So you're looking at getting people to the facility 
and trying to max out the peak demand. The people based services, this is where it gets really up into the front end of complicated because you have to be present. Entertainment, medicine, education are the top three here, but also travel. You, you can't send your body off and pick it up later. The other aspect of the people based services is because consumers are a key part of the service process they need to be given instructions as to how to perform their role. So if you're doing something like personal training and you're a personal trainer, your client's success, your success of your service product is going to be dependent on your client also doing the right thing. So you need to have the right customer who's prepared to engage in the product for this to work. Now, the other aspects of the differentiation between goods and service, which is really important to be uh, emphasizing here, is that the customer doesn't own the service. The customer owns physical goods. You go to the store, you buy your component parts for dinner, or you buy a pre-made dinner, you own that dinner. You go to a restaurant, you don't own the cook, the cooking process. You've eaten the food, sure, you take the food away, but you don't actually have ownership over the cooking process. So you can't patent, copyright, control, stockpile, or purchase a service. Oh, sorry, own a service when you buy it. The other aspects that are important is that the timing of a service and the distribution channel of a service. All of these facets lead to three fabulous and these terms are absolutely brilliant because they are going to be with I can tell you now in the services marketing subject search experience and credence come up as a really important recurring idea so I want you to look at that and I want you to really pay attention to it because we're going to come back to that on a regular basis now let's talk about how the service product is delivered because this gives us a couple of key and critical pieces of information. For those of you who want to use a service as your case product this semester, you're going to want to really go over this with a fine tooth comb. The service encounter is the point where it's customer and employee interacting together. I love the fact that it's referred to as the moment of truth because basically this is when the product happens. And you're looking at it from the point of view of the physicality of the environment, the service scape, and you're looking at it from the quality of the service. So we actually have two major theories here. We've got the service scape theory, uh, Bittner, again, 80s uh, theory. The Bittner service scape and the work that has been done around that area has some pretty complicated uh, models and diagrams that all boil down to a relatively straightforward facet of consumer behavior theory says purchase context, physical environment has an influence, and that influence is on perception of quality and decision making. Services cannot be observed. Services, therefore, are heavily influenced by the service scape because those become the triggers we use to judge the quality of the service that the intangible and visible service that we're receiving. In terms of service quality, we have a couple of other aspects here that we can work with. Perception governs reality in services. What the customer perceives is what happened to them and what is real to them. So their perceptions outweigh any objective measurement. Now, expectations, we have a model referred to as the service gap model. Uh, it's covered in the text and it's one of those ones that's a big, it's worth you having a look at now, but it's basically the fundamental core of the services subject. So a slide will not do justice to 13 weeks worth of content. But with the expectations, you can manage that through training the customer in advance what to expect, but also through understanding what does the customer see in terms of what would they talk to their peers about, what would they hear about, and then we're starting to also then bring back in this idea from consumer behavior of where is the search? When we look back to that uh, 
large model of consumer behavior and we look at where was the external search, some of that external search was word of mouth asking for people for their opinions of the service encounter. So I mentioned the dimensions of service quality and I mentioned that there were three factors that made services different from products. And this is the, these are the three factors. Number one is the search quality. And these are, when we talk about them in terms of qualities now, we're talking about them as characteristics. So products that can be examined before service have a high search quality. You can, a physical good, you can look it over, you can kick the tires, you can assess it. A service that has a high level of search to it has a more physical component. So you can look at a menu, you can look at photos on a menu and go, that's what I should expect for the food to look like. The second aspect is the experience. Experiential services are hard to judge beforehand, but you can judge during the consumption process. So you can be not sure about a concert, but then you can be at the concert and pretty sure that you're having a good time. So the experience you have to, the risk here is that you have to commit to the service to make the service to find out whether the service was worth committing to. So there's a little chicken and egg scenario here. But you also have this element where as a customer, your contribution to the experience will determine how well you enjoy the event as well. Finally is the credence product and the credence quality. And credence dominant prod products are really problematic for service quality because a credence product is where as a consumer you don't know enough about the service, the provision of the service and even its outcome to be able to tell whether you had a good or bad service. Now we always use the case example of the lawyer and the lawyer whose client gets 18 months jail time and we don't know did you have a really great lawyer because you should have been doing 25 years or did you have a really bad lawyer because you didn't do it in the first place? That's the credence problem of even after you've experienced the service, did, you know, what happened? Did that, you know, was that good or was that bad? So credence qualities are really difficult to evaluate. This is a problematic area because credence qualities are very easily manipulated negatively. So you put down, as we did in the case for the preparation, uh, if you put a lot of preparation in to avoid a problem and the problem doesn't occur, it's really easy to think that you waste the time in preparation. So this is one of the challenges here on studying in higher education is that higher education is a high credence product and preparation for an exam is a high credence product. Now you can put down a lot of preparation, do your exam and think, well, wow, that was easy. Oh, maybe I, well, maybe I, you know, I, I shouldn't have put so much effort in. Which could be a misattribution or it could be true. And that's the problem with credence, you don't know. It's also why judging higher education at the end of 13 weeks is a really interesting thing because when you come to evaluate this subject, you've got search qualities, experience qualities, and credence qualities. But you're evaluating the subject before you've experienced the use of the subject and the use of the knowledge somewhere else. So you're really using search quality and experience quality to make your judgments on the self evaluations. All right, the last two things I want to point you to, I want to point you to the one of the best models that exists. Uh, this is the Paris Humanum et al. Zethamor, I think, was involved in this as well. There are five or six authors in services who are like the A-game players. And uh, Paris Humanum Zethamol, Bittner, those three have had some of the biggest impacts in services marketing thinking. And Surfcall is one of the big ticket items. It's a combination of the service gap model, the five part model, and market research. So there are five levels of quality, and each of these levels has its a corresponding survey and that corresponding survey is done in terms of perception, 
an experience. And if you want to look up Surfcall, it's great, it's really robust. There is a rival model that was built um, in the early 2000s called Service Performance, Surfperf. Uh, Brady and Cronin, 2001, I think. That these models basically are demonstrations of how the market research chapter gets turned into a conceptual model and also gets measured in the field. But for you, for this semester, when you're thinking about service quality, the five dimensions, we refer to it as the RASA scale. Reliability, assurance, tangible, empathy, responsiveness. And if you look at this in terms of these five factors link back to the four core elements of what separates services from goods. So inseparability brings assurance and empathy. Intangibility brings reliability and tangibles. The perishability is covered in responsiveness and the variability, reliability and assurance. So we have this link and when we also go back and look at this from the point of view of what are facets that make adoption of a product more, no, well, makes it easier. Relative advantage also picks up here in terms of is this reliable? Do I feel confident in it? And does the, does the service seem to understand my needs? So surf calls really, it gets a lot of run in the services marketing subject, but it's also a really interesting area in terms of these five factors become a really quick checklist that you want to be looking at, possibly even just across all of marketing quality, but certainly in services. All right, we're going to briefly raise a couple of other ideas. Um, I just want to give you a heads up. This chapter talks about marketing of people and the idea of people as products. Personally, I'm doing research into uh, the branding of people over social media, politicians, their use of branding and Twitter. I've also done work in personal brands and brand personality where you talk about people. And I also have a personal brand. Uh, you may come across my combination logo, personal brand, which was developed after I was working on personal branding theory. But what you're looking at here with marketing of people is that in the marketing mix, we have people as a separate element, but people can also be products themselves. What is the core product of a person can be the parasocial relationship, the sense of approval, the sense of leadership, the sense of iconic status, the straight up, I like seeing this person, therefore I'm going to continue watching their movies. I like what this person has done with their life, therefore I'm going to, the core product is they're a role model. So there is this aspect of marketing people, again what you want to be thinking about is what is the core product, what is the actual product, the traits of the person, their reputation, what they've done, what is the extended product, what is the augmented product. We also have the idea of, inside this chapter of place marketing and idea marketing. Now, idea marketing was dominantly taught through social marketing, currently offline as a subject, but the social marketing concept really brings us to, we can use marketing and the theories of marketing to sell ideas and behavior. Place marketing is about tourism, uh, and it's a really interesting level of services marketing where you turn a region into a service scape. And there's been some amazing work done uh, and there's some incredible research projects that you get to do in this field. I saw a PhD student recently propose traveling the, a major tourist route, and we're talking here a 14 day, through several thousand kilometer travel as a study into physical place service marketing. It was brilliant and they were gonna get funded for basically go on a holiday and have an experience and write it up at the end. That's great. And the best part is, is that's genuine market research work because it's mystery shopping, the place marketing. So place marketing also, there's a whole 
uh, domain of tourism and physical location marketing. If that's of interest to you, let me know and I can connect you up to some of the research areas. We don't do a lot in place marketing here at the ANU, but I do know of places that do know of universities who are keen on it and interested in it. And that is services marketing. It's a highlights package because we do have a full length subject on it and in that subject we will be going into a lot more depth on things like the RASA process, the GAPS models. Give the chapter a read over and if you want to take this course in a later semester, this will be your introduction and remember what I said about innovation adoption. This will be, having read this chapter means that when you go into this course in services marketing, that it will be dynamically continuous knowledge that you'll be gaining. As always, if you need me, you can contact me on any of the ways on the screen or connect to me across Twitter or send me an email. And that is the services marketing chapter.